really the other way around. It's not just the connection between the client and the user. Okay, welcome to everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, you all know me, Gil Oman, and I am a substitute today for Indika Rajapaksi, who was thrilled to um, line up today's speaker, and then turns out he has his call to duty at DARPA, and <laughs> that's what we just heard a few minutes ago. Okay, so uh, our speaker is uh, Professor Gemanu Gunaratna. Pretty close? Yeah, that was good. He is a native of Sri Lanka, like Indika. And he uh, did his undergraduate work in mathematics at the University of Colombo, where I have been, in 1979. Then he did his master's and PhD in physics at Cornell University. And he joined the faculty at the University of Houston, Texas, in 1990. And he has been there with many other activities uh, 27 years. He's now the last four or five years the chairman of the physics department. He works on uh, nonlinear dynamics, crucial feature in physics. He works on uh, control of networks. And this is of special interest for us today since it's the topic. And um, uh, also because we have an inter-school, inter-departmental uh, cluster hire on the subject of biological networks. And our faculty member from those five who were recruited together uh, under initiative of the university president several years ago is in fact Indica. So we're very pleased about that facet of our program. and. Um, I think it gives some people here at least uh, some background for your topic today, which is model-free control of genetic networks. Now, I don't know how many of you looked at the CV in advance. How many? CV? Okay, well, then I got to tell you, if you have uh, a lot of money sloshing around and you want to have basic mathematical competence for your investment, you should look at the Physica A, 2015. Sorry. I'm 16. Um, <laughs> variable, diffusion, <laughs> stock market, variable, di variable diffusion and stock market fluctuations. <laughs> and if that's not sufficient, there's more recent guidance in the form of using dynamic mode decomposition to extract cyclic behavior in the stock market. This man of all seasons. Thank you so much for coming. Looking forward to your talk. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what did I do? Okay. Okay. And the laser pointer is? Oh, okay. Good. 
Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and for the introduction. Uh, I'll motivate the problem I'm doing first and th then talk about it. So it's an ambitious motivation. I'm not going to actually solve the problem uh, uh, that I'm going to introduce here. Uh, okay, if you think about genetic diseases, I'm not, I, I'm not talking about Mendelian diseases which are controlled by a the mutation of a single gene, but rather diseases which have some genetic basis, like cancer or diabetes or like disease like that. Where what happens is that the level of genes that are expressed in a cell changes from the normal behavior. And I'm trying to ask myself, uh, so here, for example, is uh, is data from a class of brain cancer uh, called glioblastoma. Yeah, and what I have here is two groups of patients, uh, gene expression levels from two groups of patients with different subtypes of the cancer. And as you can see, there are I think I have shown 30 genes here. Uh, how the okay? How they are expressed? Are, uh, uh, some of them are overexpressed and others are underexpressed, over and under meaning relative to the other group. Uh, so, so there are, I mean, thirty actually more than thirty genes. Are, <coughs> I haven't shown everything. Okay, that are differentially expressed in in these problems. Now, if you think about it, it's very unlikely that you'll have thirty mutations. Like it's that this probably ha uh, happens because there are two or maybe three mutations uh, and the rest are differentially expressed because of uh, couplings between these genes. Okay, so the question then is, <clears throat> is it possible to change the, like a few genes to get back to like a target state which is a disease-free state? Okay, another problem uh, would be, so okay, here is a schematic of uh, uh, how a genome looks, it, like it's folded in, into the chromosomes and so on. Uh, in this problem, these authors looked at what happens uh, uh, to Drosophila, uh, the head of the brain cells in the like in Drosophila, if I mean, <clears throat> they have been introduced uh, to alcohol. So what happens is that uh, the foldings of the genome uh, change. Genome folds in a, uh, inside these brain cells fold in a particular way, in such a way that uh, some of the genes cannot be read anymore. And so the expression profile outside the nucleus in the cytoplasm it would be different. And <clears throat> what that does is allow the animal to uh, uh, tolerate alcohol better. What that also means is that I mean, if they're allowed to uh, take alcohol in, they'll take more of it. Okay, so that's the model of addiction. Yeah, so here what happens is something outside of uh, these epigenetics uh, the genome hasn't changed, but because of the folding, uh, uh, the, uh, the levels of genes that are outside uh, will have changed. Okay, so once again, the question is, okay, can you then design a therapy or the like, called treatment uh, or to prevent the action that is caused by this uh, misfolding, if you will, so okay, reorganization? Okay. Uh, that the problem here is that these genes are, like, are typically connected in some very complicated network. Okay, we okay, don't know what all the associated genes are. Okay, so this is associated with the biological process, maybe the cancer or alcohol, uh, addiction. And then we certainly don't know like the precise nature of the interaction. Okay, so we don't know yeah, we cannot write down a very accurate model of the 
underlying uh, network underlying uh, the biological process. Okay, so the problem then is, uh, <clears throat> can you control the complicated network that's unknown because it should be a model-free uh, uh, control of the network. So that's what the problem is. And uh, I'll explain this a little bit more and then give that. Uh, I mean, one of the possible solutions. Again, so like if there are mutations in the genome uh, or in the nucleus, this I call misfoldings, for example, it's very, very difficult to correct them. It's not impossible, but it's very difficult to correct uh, the genome. Now, what happens in the genome is uh, it's being read by machines, and, and there are genes that are produced which come to the cytoplasm. Okay, and the genes then uh, 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 translate to proteins, and it's the proteins that do most of the body's work. So, yeah, but however, changing, like or correcting the genome is, like, uh, is a difficult task. So what happens is you, like you want to be able to, okay, try to change. Uh, the next best thing is to change what's happening here. So, okay, so what happens in the cytoplasm is that there are different levels of genes, and they interact to form, okay, form proteins and and do the body's work. So if there's a defective cell, uh, the idea, the okay, the point is that the levels of the genes that are expressed is different. And that's what you want to be modifying. So, like to set this problem up, you want to first find out how to characterize the state of the cell or the cytoplasm. Again, I'm not going into the genome, but I'm looking at the cytoplasm and what happens there. Because you need to, okay, first, okay, try to figure out how to characterize what's happening outside here. And I'm only going to be looking at what I refer to as stationary state. Now, okay, any self-respecting cell is not going to be in a stationary state. It's, uh, it's going to be dynamic. So, uh, so what do I mean by stationary? I mean, in some kind of an average sense, uh, it's a fixed state. So it's, like, it's not going to be either periodically or chaotically evolving, but it might that there might be statistical fluctuations, and on average, it will uh, uh, be in a fixed state. So how do I characterize this state? One of the possibilities is to characterize it using the levels of all of the genes. Levels mean the concentration of all of the genes inside uh, the cytoplasm. If it is true, things become easier than become because with sequencing, with RNA seq, for example, you can find out all uh, the levels of all the genes inside a cell. In fact, even in a single cell now. Uh, if not, you need to extend this state. But okay, but right now, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to assume that I can characterize these states by okay, characterize the state of the cell. Okay, by the gene expression profile. That is to say, the levels of all of the genes. Okay, so you can get this by sequencing uh, RNA seq, for example. So I'm also going to assume that the cells with identical gene expression profiles will behave the same way. Again, this can be, if this doesn't work, this could be extended by adding some other uh, uh, information. So, okay, if this is the case, though, any <clears throat> differences uh, in the cells, so a normal cell, disease-free state versus the disease state is, is given by a, a differential expression of the genes. Uh, yeah, so the control problem then is, okay, you have an initial state, okay, which might be a, uh, the state with the disease, and you have a target state, which might be a disease-free state, a normal person. Okay, so you know what these states are, okay, and the control problem is to change the levels of the genes from the disease state to the disease-free state. Okay, how do you do that? 
And if it's to be uh, practical at all, you will need to do this by controlling the levels of a small set of genes. Okay, so that's an, yeah, an example of a uh, network control problem. Okay, so here's a specific example that we are proposing. Uh, okay, we haven't done this, but uh, it's a proposed experiment. Uh, it's sleep deprivation in Drosophila. So Drosophila is the, or the fruit flies. Okay, in the evening, this, they are up for about three hours, typically between six and nine. Uh, in the evening, and after that, they let their sleep. And, and what the experimenters did here, Zimmerman et al. did, was to prevent them from sleeping by shaking the container. And uh, so, uh, this, when you sleep deprived the animal, there's a network that's activated, a homeostatic network, uh, which prevents trauma from the uh, like from sleep deprivation. And okay, sleep deprivation, so okay, because of this, uh, the action of the homeostatic network leads to behavioral changes. Okay, shorter sleep late, like latency. That is to say, when you allow them to sleep, they sleep faster, and they sleep longer after sleep deprivation. Uh, there's an increased arousal threshold that to wake them is difficult, and then they like have low associative learning. It's actually an interesting experiment here. Uh, I mean, what they <coughs> do is to uh, give them two smells, and after one smell, they shock them. After you pass, you mean, allow them to learn this a few times, they'll learn to avoid the bad smell. Yeah, but if they're sleep deprived, they cannot do that. So all of these properties are just like us. So like the genetics, that's what Zimmerman et al. did that they found out that in this sleep-deprived state, 159 genes are out, <coughs> either up or down regular. This is in the uh, head transcriptome. And probably these are the nodes that belong to the, the, the homeostatic network. Okay, but if you go through and look at the literature of Drosophila gene interaction, only about 50 are known to even be interacting okay, within this group. So not all interactions are even known right now. Uh, okay, so the goal would be like, to genetically modify this, like these genes in the head transcriptome to get to a sleep deprived like state. And then if you are successful, okay, we could check if the, uh, if the behavioral changes are seen in these genetically modified animals. Okay, so that is an example of that what can be done if you have okay, know about control. Let me just ask, why not I don't know much about how flies sleep. I mean, what's the So when they sleep, their posture is, uh, is known because that's what they do. And okay, and also in the test tubes that they like that they sit, there's a laser that goes through there. Okay, so if they move, the laser captures that motion. Yes, that's how they, uh, they identify that thing. Uh, and again, it's very important that this, that uh, one be able to do this transition using a small number of genes, otherwise it's, uh, it's not practical. Okay, so I have talked about uh, the, like the need to study network and I mean, the need to know these interactions. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have assumed that the state can be specified using some node values, gene expression levels, for example, in the like in the genetic network. So, how do we get this? And what I'm going to <coughs> propose next is, rather than knowing the network, if you look for that the response of the system to certain perturbations, so you'll add or they call lower the level uh, uh, concentration of genes and ask yourself what happens to the entire network. Okay, and okay, what I'll argue is that with that information, if you pick a particular <coughs> group of perturbations, 
Yeah, you can actually use what I call the response surfaces. Response surfaces are what would happen. So if I have, like if I'm changing the levels of two genes externally, I, I, I can control it maybe that gene and that gene externally. Okay, what would happen to the rest of the system? So in this case, there are 159 nodes, and, and so this should be 159 dimensional space. Like you're changing two of them and asking what happens to the rest of them. That's what the response surface would be. And what I will argue is that if you, if you know what these response surfaces are, you can figure out okay, how to move the system to the target state. And uh, okay, the second thing is that these response surfaces are often smooth surfaces. Probably has to do with evolution in the end, but okay, certainly in model systems and, and the experiments that I'm going to talk about later, these are smooth surfaces. So they can be approximated by with a few points on the surface, and those are the points that you get by uh, with the mutation. And so once you can approximate this surface, it gives a low-order approximation to the surface, and, and that approximation is good enough for control. So X1 is the level of one of the genes, maybe this one, and X2 is the level of another gene. Okay, and I mean X7 is a representation of all the rest of it. it yeah, I mean, in this case, it, uh, it's going to be 159 dimensional space. Okay, so what this is, what happens as I control two genes to the rest of the genes? How, I mean, how does the system respond? Right, so I, I, I mean, I'm showing it in three dimensions, but it's uh, it's a large number of dimensions. So, so okay, let me tell you what the algorithm is. So, so let's take a model system. I'll uh, like, I'll just think of a simple model like this, and this is one of the models that we did in the ex uh, like I'll talk about the electrical circuit later. But this is one of the experiments that we did on an electrical circuit, and the electrical circuit was built to model. Uh, network like that. So the first step is so you <laughs> pick one of the nodes, any node. Okay, so in the ge uh, genetic system, you might want to start with the transcription factor. Okay, that helps. Or in a, like an electrical circuit, you might want to start with a node that's highly connected. You see, okay, it, uh, uh, or you pick any node, maybe node one. Okay, and what you're first asking is, what would happen if the level of, of node 1 changes? Okay, so the concentration of the gene, uh, of that gene, or in the case of electrical network, it will be the node potential here. Okay, you change the node potential uh, uh, uniformly, and then find out what happens to the rest of the gene. So that's what I'm plotting here. Again, in this case, this should be in 15, 16 dimensions altogether. Like I'm changing one of them, that's this X1, and I'm looking at what happens to the rest of the node. Okay, so there might be some, like some complicated nonlinear form, which we don't know. I mean, can get it experimentally, but again, you don't actually have to get it experimentally. Uh, so, okay, you want to, like, to make a low order approximation, okay, which is good enough, and I'll, I'll tell you so later okay, that this is probably as I mean, given that there's noise in the genomic data, okay, this is probably the best you can do anyway. So, yeah, if, if you want to do a linear approximation, for example, all you need are two points on this curve. Okay, the two points can be, one of them can be the normal state, the cell that you started with. Okay, the second one can, for example, be a knockout. Okay, you knock out one gene, okay, partially knock out one gene and find out Okay, how the system responds. Yeah, so in the case of animals, you, like you knock out one of these 159 genes and find out okay, how the organism evolves. Do a sequencing experiment again on this, uh, this mutant animals and get the second point. Okay, anyway, once you do this, you have a linear approximation to, the, like to this actual response. Okay. okay. The next step is, if the target that you want to get to that is close to this line, you're done because all you need to do is you want to get here. That's the target state you want to get to. So if it is near to this line, you're done because all you need to do is to control this one gene at that level. Again, the system will be close to that. 
okay. Yeah, but given that this is a high dimensional system, this is very unlikely. So, okay, so the I mean target will not typically be not close to the like this first response. What that means is is that by controlling this one gene, okay, you cannot okay, cannot get to the target state. Okay. Okay, so you need more than one gene to work with then. Okay, you at least at least need a second uh, uh, node to control. Okay, so the question is, okay, how how do you figure out what the next best node is? Remember, I don't have a model for this system. All I have is data. So yeah, so can I? So, so what I know now is that changing this is not enough. I, I I need to be able to use one of the others to control it. And okay, how, how do I pick that next node? Okay, and this is a very simple idea. So Okay, so what I mean by distance here is there's some Euclidean distance, maybe a weighted Euclidean distance, weight because maybe you want to have uh, that some genes, it's, it's more important for some genes to be close to the target state maybe. So otherwise, other, other than the weight, it's going to be Euclidean distance. So okay, suppose, let's take an extreme example first. So okay, suppose this was not uh, close to my line, only because one of these genes, let's say gene 16, could not be uh, uh, come close to the target state. Everything else could be okay close to the target state, but not this one. So let's think of that as a uh, uh, as an example. How do I figure out just from this data that, that this was the offending node? Yeah, the idea is very simple. So. So if I redefine the distances that by setting W16 to equal zero, I would get semi close to this because that is the bad node, right? So all I have to do is to redefine my distances with WN being zero, uh, W16 being zero, and I would be close to the place where I want to. So by redefining the like the measure, just so all I need to have is these two points and the, yeah, and the target state, and by redefining the distances, all of this is done calculationally. I can figure out uh, that node 16 uh, was the bad node, okay, the node that needed to be corrected in addition to node 1. Okay, so the I mean, generically from data, you'll calculate the delta the, by setting one W n that to zero at a time. Each time you set one of them to zero and find out which one maybe brings the smallest delta. And then that would be the node, uh, the one that corresponds to the smallest delta is the node that I need to add to the, the uh, alpha control. All of this is done computationally, just from data so far. And okay, and once that's done, you recalculate uh, Okay, so once it's done, and okay, now I'm controlling two genes. So maybe it was one and seven, say, in this example. Okay, now the response function, the response, so the surface is a two-dimensional surface. Okay, and once again, I go through the same process. I, I, I have to approximate this surface uh, uh, with a small number of nodes. So the linear approximation will need to get three points. Okay, I already have, have two points. Right, the, like the original state and the uh, the first uh, uh, first mutant, so a mutant of gene one. Okay, okay. So what I yeah what I do now is to get a mutant of uh, 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 gene seven. Okay, and with these three points, I can approximate uh, the actual surface with uh, with the plane surface in this. Okay, now you ask yourself again, is your point, like, is your target state okay, close to this surface? If it is, you're done. Uh, by controlling these two genes, I, uh, I can get to the target state. If it's not, okay, you, like you get the next, like the next node you need to control. Okay, so you can systematically just, uh, figure out the genes that need to be controlled in order to get to the target state. 
you know, the interesting result is that okay, if I created the mutant state that, that by modifying externally modifying say three genes, I can also like get close to the target state with the same number of genes. It doesn't have to be the same genes because this network is connected. If I have modified, if I get the mutant state by so changing genes five, six, and seven. I, like, I might be able to change 1, 12, and 16 maybe to, like, to get close to the original state. Right? It's because of the connectivity of, of the network. It doesn't have to be the same node. But, okay, but typically, like, with the same number of changes, I, ca I can get back to the, close to the original state. And at most, there's one more. In, you know, I don't have a proof of this result, but like, we've done many examples. And uh, in each case, uh, in each case, we were able to control that this entire system back to the original, like or close to the original state. Uh, it's not exact. Uh, it comes about 15% uh, distance. Okay, it comes to about 10 to 15% like from <coughs> uh, where I started. But this thing is non-zero only because I'm approximating uh, the curved surface by a linear surface. That's the reason why it's not zero. Okay, if the nonlinearities are small, uh, this becomes much closer. Okay, so it is a <coughs> upshot of the approximation. Uh, so, okay, I, I, I'll just give a okay, note on epistasis. Epistasis is sometimes okay, considered a measure of that nonlinearity. Yeah, so the statement is that if you, if you change one gene and your response is somewhere here, or a response meaning what the level of the rest of the genes would be, the levels of the genes would be. And if you change a second gene and you get a second response, if you make uh, change both of them, you should get the sum of responses. That's, yeah, I mean, if your system is linear, that's what would happen. So, like, it's a measure of nonlinearity would be how, uh, so okay, how how different that like, is what happens when both are changed. You have to be a little bit okay, a little bit careful with this. Okay, so what you're assuming here is that you change one of these uh, uh, one of the genes, and and then the level is like is something, and change the second gene here. Okay, and if you change both of them, I mean, where you're going to be is the sum of these vectors. Okay, but the problem is. Like it's not quite correct, I, and if you do this with our model systems or with the experimental systems, like I'll talk about, this doesn't work. Okay, but the <laughs> thing is that since these networks are coupled, when you change one gene, the other one changes as well. Okay, so actually, that's not the point you're getting to, but it's this point that you're getting to because I mean, although you control only one gene, yeah, yeah the network connectivity changes the second gene as well. Same thing happened when the second gene is changed. Okay, and really when you change both genes, what happens is the sum of these two changes, not these two changes, but these two changes. And, like, like, and the sum should be that. And that, okay, in the, like in the, both in the model systems and the experiment, this works very well. Uh, again, not exact, so nonlinearity is important, but it's very close. Okay. Okay. So here's the electrical circuit. The electrical circuit had uh, uh, up to 50 nodes. I'll, yeah, I mean, what I showed was a smaller one, a and the circuit contained uh, transistors, so they were nonlinear, and we uh, uh, didn't know what a good model is. So all of the rest of it was done experimentally. So I mean, what we okay, found was so, like we randomly figure out, uh, 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 figure out a state, and okay, not quite randomly. We change about three or four nodes arbitrarily, and uh, and then figure out what the response of the system is. So that's what the mutant is. Okay, and now without figuring out which nodes we change, we <coughs> try to get to that mutant state. Okay, and we could get to the state by 
uh, uh, controlling a few names, a uh, few nodes. Uh, the nodes that we controlled were different from the original uh, ones that we changed. So once again, we, we pretended we didn't know what was happening uh, to the network, but were able to control the, the system to the states where we wanted. Now, uh, you could do one improvement. Now for the electrical circuit, we could, I mean, we have very good data. There's no noise. And rather than approximating uh, it with a plane, you could do a second order approximation, quadratic approximation. That would be a lot better than here. OK, so we want to ask ourselves if this is meaningful to do a quadratic approximation. And remember, instead of a line like this, you could take one more point and do a quadratic approximation. That would be, I mean, would be much better. The question we asked ourselves was, is this worth doing? So it turns out, no. Uh, like in the experiment, if there's no noise at all, okay, the plane approx the the, uh, the uh, values were roughly about, I mean, five volts. The node potentials were about five volts on average, and, like, and the differences between the surface and the plane, it was about 150 millivolts. So it's already only about, like, only a few percent of, of the values. Again, if we did a quadratic approximation, it's, uh, it's much closer. It's, well, it's an order of magnitude closer, roughly. OK, but if you add 5% noise to the data, so it turns out that the plane of approximation is worse, but the quadratic approximation is a lot worse. And again, by the time you add, add, you add about 10% like noise to the data, uh, there's essentially no difference. And I, I, like I'm picking 10% here because that's the kind of errors that you have in gene expression levels. So I mean, you could do more experiments to get the quadratic state, but it's not worth doing it because of the errors in the other fluctuations in the data. OK, so now I have, OK, what I have gone through is, like, is the way to control this network. I mean, systematically add more and more nodes. All of these are done with the. Uh, from data, and you can systematically get closer and closer to the target state. And uh, there's no point improving beyond the linear stage because of the uh, noise in the data. So, okay, so we haven't done the control experiment on animals, but okay, one thing we might ask is are there any testable predictions that we can do, okay, other than control? So yeah, it turns out there is one that I, uh, okay, so one I can say. So if you have this surface, if you have the approximation to the surface, what you can do is, like, is for example, if I do a double knockout, if, uh, or if I knock out both these genes, okay, uh, yeah, I can, I can predict what's going to happen because that is what the surface is doing. Okay, what the surface is is what happens if I control. Uh, the first and third gene, okay, what would be the rest of the system like do? So one such example is a double knockout. Okay, knockout genes one and okay, one and three, and okay, from this data you should be able to predict what the what the double knockout predictions are. Uh, uh, this double knockout, knockout state will do. So what we've done is uh, to look at some data, some published data on oxygen. Oxygen deprivation network of E. coli. So this oxygen deprivation network has five transcription factors, and the data from this group gave the knockout data for the five five genes and also for a double knockout. So so if our approach is correct, okay, we could use the wild type and actually, okay, that uh, yeah that knockout. And that knockout, okay, and predict what happens to the double knockout. Okay, so we actually, okay, so check if we could do the prediction. And we went through the gene ontology, uh, I mean, data to figure out that the oxygen deprivation network had roughly 284 genes. And we actually did the five dimensional one rather than the two, they both give the same results, by the way. Uh, 
Okay, approximately 70 percent of the predictions like that we made for the knockout, this double knockout okay, were within the, uh, the 95 percent confidence interval. This is not just to say that the genes would be up or down regulated. These are quantitative comparisons. Okay, I don't think any, any model can give anything like this. Um, I mean, model of 247 genes. I mean, I don't know anyone that can I mean, do that well. It, it's not perfect, but it is pretty good. And uh, okay, one of the ones that we uh, that didn't work okay was this. Uh, oh, I don't remember the name of this. Okay, so one of these things is okay, CRO eight. Okay, anyway, that gene. Uh, like our predictions were like that. Okay, so most of the genes, the ones that are right, the predictions are like that, and and the values are, I mean, the experimental values are something like that. Okay, so that's the seventy percent of it. Here's one of okay, one of them that didn't work. Our okay predictions were like that, okay, and the data was there. Okay, certainly the prediction was wrong, and we went back and looked at the uh, the biochemistry of this. Turns out that the, the gene and the protein uh, activate each other. Okay, so what you have is a feed-forward uh, a loop. So one property of the feed-forward loop is there's bistability. Okay, so if you change something, there's a second state that can be far away, and okay, that like it's possible that that's what's happening here. Okay, now this is a very simple feed-forward network. Okay, does it? Okay, in the other cases, in most other cases, there was no simple feed-forward network like that, but there could be a, feed, a larger feed-forward network. We don't know, uh, yeah, but at least in this one example, of the of the predictions that failed, there was a feed-forward network. There were two like this actually, uh, a very simple feed-forward network. So, so again, the next thing, I'll, I mean, like I said before, our, like our proposal is to I mean, test this on Drosophila, and uh, that there's a couple of ex so okay, the genetic shows that there are 114 genes that are downregulated and 55 that are upregulated, and we're looking at the <coughs> Drosophila interaction database. These are the Okay, so the known interactions are like this. What's in green are the transcription factors, and in so get blue are like are some of the other genes. So okay, that's the gene list. Uh, anyway, okay, okay. So once again, so okay, before doing the control experiment, like we actually tested for a double knockout uh, prediction in this case. So. Okay, what we were looking at was to get two genes, SDC and stuff B, which is here. And we looked at the double knockout and again predicted the double knockout. The good news is that, that we made 45 predictions, all were within uh, the 95% confidence interval level. The bad news is that the average, uh, the error bars were quite large. So we had to redo the experiment uh, with more experiments to get. Uh, the error bar is small, and that is being done. Uh, okay, so here's a typical example. The predictions are like that, and uh, I mean the data is like that. Okay, but again, these error bars are, I mean, should have been smaller so for us to be for us to be confident. Okay, so so to summarize. Okay, the networks are like the actual biological networks are very complicated, and well, you can think of the Peter Paul Rubens uh, picture of a landscape. Okay, where he paints every blade of grass and every this leaf on on the tree. It's an amazing picture, but I mean, it's a lot of work to get there. On the other hand, you could also think of drawing a landscape like this where you focus on the essence of what you need to focus on. Okay, and forget about the rest. And okay, that's the 
kind of approach I, like I've taken in this in this model free approach not worry about the details of, of the model but okay but this, can you control it without knowing that and hopefully I, like I have convinced you that at least in this case that approach might be the better approach so okay so the model uh, the model free approach only requires uh, the response surfaces or really low order approximations of the <coughs> response surfaces and that can be got through mutants assuming that the mute uh, the organisms uh, 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 survive the mutation uh, and if not you need to pick another different gene uh, yeah so the target uh, state can be systematically approached by adding adding to the number of control genes and also typically the number of control genes is, uh, is very small so, okay so you only have to control a small number of genes okay and the prediction was uh, were tested in the oxygen deprivation network also on dream data I didn't talk about it but like, like there's a data set provided by this dream network which is okay somebody writes down a model and writes down the uh, I mean gives the expression the tabulates the expression levels of certain mutants and, like and that's all they do. all they do they don't give the model yeah and the challenge is then to like, to extract the underlying model I'm, like, I wasn't interested in that I was interested whether the double knockouts could be predicted by the uh, uh, with the single knockouts and that also worked very well uh, yeah, again, I haven't talked about this, but these ideas generalize to uh, to the seasonally driven uh, networks like circadian networks. Everything carries through to like to those systems. Also, adding noise to the like to the genetic itself, uh, like the approach still works. So the applications are like, like I talked about sleep deprivation. Also, another one is addiction and also anxiety. These are the so okay, the three systems that we want to control. Uh, addiction, I briefly talked about addiction at the like at the beginning. Anxiety, again, this that like these anxious mutants are uh, okay. I mean, normal flies. If you I mean, release them in an arena, they will walk around like and observe the arena, and after a while, they settle down there. That they're comfortable, and these anxious ones don't. They keep moving like round and round. So these are the like it's a model for anxiety. Again, can you change the anxiety of these anxious animals back to the normal state by modifying a few genes? So these are the okay problems we are proposing to do. Okay, finally, okay. So let me ask, how does a physicist cure cancer? And the answer is by putting twice to six. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have you looked at how, oh sorry, um, have you looked at the scaling of your absolute error with the network size? Uh, what does that do? Yeah, the or network the complexity, the connectivity, for example. Like the error does not change. Error depends only on the nonlinearity of of the system. So, so if the non, uh, network is very nonlinear, that the errors are about, I mean, what I showed, ten to fifteen percent. Yeah, if the nonlinearity is smaller, which I can do in the model system, like I find that I can get very close. If it's a linear system, you can exactly get there. Right, but if you keep the same level of nonlinearity, for example, you go from a 15 to a 30 node system, but you use only the same number of uh, node removals to parameterize your response surface, the error stays the same? Well, more or less the same, maybe increased by a few percent. Yeah, but it, it doesn't scale with the number, for example. Hmm. So, yeah, so this 15% rate that I quoted, like we went up to 40 nodes, or 44 nodes. Uh, and it didn't increase uh, uh, very much. Okay, but in the synthetic models, we have reduced the nonlinearity. 
okay, and then it, it, it can be closer. So, but yeah, there it scales with, okay, with the nonlinearity in some complex way. Right, so that is a hard question. Uh, so if you, if you look at, let's say, a diabetic. Yeah, I mean, people who are non-diabetic are in a large range, I mean, large range in genomic space, right? Yeah, so the diabetics might be way out there. So all you need to do is to get somewhere close to there. And what that is uh, has to come from data. I mean, in the end, you've got to find a lot of patients or, or, or normal people and find out I mean, what the extent of the region is that way, I mean, where you want to get to. Yeah, so I cannot predetermine that. I kind of have two questions. One is, in the network, if the input data represent a novel challenge to the system, would you uncover additional nodes that are important? Yeah. So, I mean, I was talking with uh, uh, earlier today, and uh, yeah, so there might be small molecules that might be also important to define the state of the system. I mean, in the end, the cell itself uh, is not only the genes, but proteins and other molecules are also important, right? I have assumed that the gene expression levels is enough to characterize the state. And so I'm, I mean, one thing I'm thinking about is stationary state. Yeah, because if it's dynamical, certainly it won't be because there are time delays in the uh, in the protein production, but yeah, are genes enough there? If not, you need to add those things into the. Okay. So uh, the topology the of the network will depend on new data that people collect. Uh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I haven't used that for the control though. I, like I'm assuming that all of these are connected somehow, and the algorithm depends only on the node values, not on the actual network. My second question is: sometimes there are uh, multiple levels of hierarchy. That is. The microphone one. That is, yeah, that is, so you have, uh, say, in a circadian rhythm, you have a cyclic pattern intracellularly, or, and then they form a, a local oscillator, but yeah. then the, you have multi-region um, slave uh, master uh, network of networks yeah. that you have to, I guess, have to build which oscillator matters in that ensembles of such oscillators. Uh, so. Okay, again, yeah, so even if you look at, yeah, I mean, there have been studies of uh, the expression levels on single tissue, like the liver, and, and the even neighboring cells don't have the same expression levels, right? There's a range of expression levels. People have found this. So what I am talking about is somehow averaging, sort of increasing the levels of all this by all of them by a fixed amount. Okay, whereas the DC state will have different, I mean, very different, hopefully, the very different levels of individual cells even. And so it's the average that's getting moved, I mean, moved near this other state. Okay, does that answer your question? Yeah. It's actually not because the network is disturbed for each individual unit, but it's on a different level. It is the uh, it's probably the uh, the underlying reason is probably a different level. Maybe some microRNAs or something else will affect all these levels, right? So I mean, I don't care about the origin. Of, I mean, I'm not looking for the origin of, of the of the changes, but I'm trying to change it back to where it was by some other means. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah, so I have a quick question. Um, there are worked out, at least in uh, mammals, these uh, master transcription factors. Yeah. And then the uh, other transcription factors they control. Mm -hmm. And you know, so there's this whole super enhancer, enhancer transcription, master transcription factor kind of hierarchy. And it was it was interesting to me because some of you're doing it sort of agnostically, I yeah, think, right. right? 
And so I'm wondering, um, because I noticed some of the genes you had, I would define in mammals as being actually uh, master transcription factors, but they're under the control of other nodes, right. right? That in fact the control algorithm when I okay when I do it, I, I mean I typically start with one of the top. Uh, I mean the picture I'm talking about is the network. Uh, yeah, so let me show you the network. Yeah, I'm, right. Like I'm talking about this network. Okay, so typically in controlling, I start with one of the top nodes. So these are the, I mean, what I would call the trans, uh, microRNA. Okay. okay, so the transcription factors would be the second level, like with control genes. So the upper level would be something like microRNA or so small molecules. So some kind of regulatory right, some RNAs or something. So some kind you of work this out from the bi biology of the software? I mean, the model is built to have two levels of regulation because of like what I know from biology. Right? Okay. okay. And then I start with your model, whether it's miRNA or something. No, no, it doesn't matter. So no, it doesn't matter, right? Because the microRNAs are not likely to be in that position of nucleus, right? Well, microRNA. I mean, all that this is is the control, right? So there might be a microRNA which uh, which controls a whole lot of genes and transcription factors. Uh, right. Uh, very small levels, but but they'll act on it. So, and and then there are transcription factors which would act on, act on lots of genes. So this network was built to somehow have that topology like in some small way. But when I control, I start with one of these things. Okay, and the second one might be a gene here. Yeah. Okay, and the third one might end up being being a transcription factor. And that is like it's all determined by the algorithm. Yes. And it's a surprising thing that, that, that you can control the network to the place where you want to by controlling that, that, and that maybe. Okay, but that depends on the initial state and where I start from, but the important thing is that because of the connectivity, it doesn't have to be a particular three genes that right. you need. You can take this many combinations of genes, and that's that's, very uh, interesting. that's why the whole thing works. Yeah, yeah. Thiago, Brian. Well, no, I, you know, Jerry and I were looking at this because we thought that. Um, you know, my interest is in this these kinds of things is when you can have a model that uh, is informed by the biology and then plug some features in that you know you can nail down with the experiments and then try to write read out other features that would be connected or could help refine the regulatory circuit or what you're trying to understand the relationship between the control, especially with these hierarchical elements. You know, we are interested in. You know, we might have a gene variant. We might have that related to the enhancer or promoter, or even in an intron. And then um, certain downstream signals are read. And what we'd like to do is take the data that we have, plug it into something like this, and use this to generate new hypotheses of discoveries. Is this that is possible? A, it's pro I mean, I wouldn't say, say it's uh, impossible. Certainly, like somebody might do it. But, but, but given that these systems are nonlinear. This is a very hard thing to do. I, I mean, when I was a graduate student. I mean, you know, another way is, I guess, with these phenotypes, like these sleep phenotypes, you've got a phenotype that your drive, you know, your control circuit is driving to. Right. That puts constraints on. So I guess the other question is relating to overfitting or, you know, things I mean, of that nature. Right. For nonlinear system, these are typically very difficult to do because it's sensitive on the parameters. And that's the reason for this sort of stepping back and looking at. Uh, kind of an overall picture. Yeah, so, I mean, back when I was a graduate student, we, okay, we, I mean, challenges are each other with, with data, and one of the challenges we gave some of the other students was, okay, if you take a simple nonlinear system, it was a, I mean, three differential equations, okay, and, and give data, the output, yeah, and ask the other person to, yeah, right, I mean, try to get what, what the equation was. They couldn't do it. Nobody could do it. Uh, and then one of us, uh, one of my colleagues, put this challenge in the Los Alamos database and challenge of I mean, anybody do it? Couldn't do it. <laughs> All he asked was, given this data, so okay, predict the next, okay, next so many seconds of data. Nobody could do it. So, so I mean, so 
So these systems are much more complicated. There's many more nodes, and the nonlinearities are not even simple. These are sigmoidal nonlinearities, sometimes very sharp. And uh, so, I mean, I think it will be very difficult to do that uh, from data. I mean, if you can look at individual interactions and get one interaction at a time, maybe you can build it that way. I mean, right now we are very far from doing that. Like I was even talking about the sleep deprivation network in Drosophila. I mean, there are 159 genes that are changing, but if you look at the, uh, the interaction database, there's only 50, that, 50 of those that are connected to, well, 48 of them that are known to be connected to each other. Yeah, even in Drosophila, and this is the one that has been studied for 35 years yeah. now, and even that's so incomplete. So that's just the interaction. Then what the form of the interactions? These are complex biochemical equations, not single equations. There are multiple equations. So the form that you have is how do you even get that? We don't know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, any last question? Let me thank you on behalf of the whole group. Uh, very thought-provoking. Very good.